Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Seth with SethProler.com, and I'm here today with Blake Bowles. If you've been following me for any period of time, you know that I'm an executive function coach in Colorado, and I help struggling students navigate this thing called school. And my buddy Blake here, who I've known oddly, and I don't even know how we met, probably through World Domination Summit or something. That sounds right. Um, so we met through sort of a group of people who do um, unconventional work, a lot of them are bloggers or vloggers or podcasters or authors or things like that. Um, but they don't take traditional life paths. So somehow we got to know each other over the years here and there. And Blake just came out with a book. And then we'll talk about that in a minute. But I have Blake on today because, A, um, just to mention what's going on with the book that he's working on right now. And B, because it's so aligned with the stuff that I do that I want to ask him. We discussed this before we started tonight. I want to ask him some genuine questions um, for, based on the concept of the book that you, my audience, are going to, I think, appreciate quite a bit. Blake, what's up? Hi, Seth. Good to Hi, be buddy. here. Um, tell them a little bit about your site and so Blake li lives a very unconventional life. I love it, but tell them a little bit about your website, how you got into this, um, and maybe your books and your offerings and stuff real quick. What do you sure. have? Yeah. My main website is Blake Bowles, B O L E S dot com. And that's where I have all my writing, my podcast, and there's links there to the travel company I've been running for about a decade now for teenagers who don't go to school. And I've called that unschool adventures. Uh, but previously, I've I've written about teenagers like this, about how to go, to, how they go to college if they don't have a high school diploma, about what they can do if they choose not to go to college at all to still grow up and be successful, functional adults. And uh, I have another book about self-directed learning and just what that looks like, because it's a phrase that we we throw around easily, but when it comes down to it, it's a pretty tricky thing. Awesome. So, and your new book is called Why Are You Still Sending Your Kids to School? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's deliberately provocative and it's, it's meant for parents whose kids are clearly not a good fit for school, but the parents think, well, this is just what you have to do. You have right. to keep sending your kids to normal conventional school. And so that's why the title is Why Are You Still Sending Your Kids to School? Because I say, there are lots of other really great things you'd be doing with your kid, which are not conventional school. And they run a whole gamut from like just kind of more typical. Well, don't say that yet because that's what I want to ask you about today. So don't, right, don't, don't get into that right yet. So before you get into <laughs> that, I want to set it up a little bit because okay. the, the people that follow me are following me because their kid is 2E or they just have executive function struggles. So they struggle with planning, time management, organization, blah, blah, blah. But there is a whole spectrum of kids that I work with. And what you said before, I find very, very, very true. And I even got another email today from a parent that, that has a 10-year-old that wants to do a consult with me. And they literally want to do a consult with me about a 10 year old who doesn't fit in the box and should they switch schools and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And I have some stock answers that I use for that question. But one of them is that it's always a crapshoot and you can send your kid to the school that seems like it should be the perfect fit. But I've seen it so many times where they'll go to a private school or a Montessori school or a uh, charter school or something that should, and it just on paper and on the internet, it looks so aligned with what the kids need, but then they go there there, and it's just not what it seemed like. Uh, or they could stay in the same school or they could go to a school that's rated way worse, get a teacher that absolutely adores them, makes them feel seen and heard and understood, and it's the best experience ever. But Either way, I have had so many experiences, Blake, where I have families that ha we have been indoctrinated in the story that you go to school, then you go to college, then you get a job, then you retire, then you die, blah, blah, blah. What's supposed to happen is you're supposed to go through school and get the education you need. But as we know, with these kids who struggle with executive function who don't fit in the box, and I know that you're, those are more my terms. Um, I, you probably say neurodiverse or other terms. But with these kids that don't fit in the box, there are kids who 
they are suffering and they need some other alternatives. So feel free to fill in the blanks of what I just said, and then let's start diving into what are alternatives. Yeah, uh, yeah, neurodiverse kids are definitely part of the audience. There are also a lot of kids out there who might not uh, you know, meet that classification, but are just bored out of their minds or the, the, the inanity, the, the bureaucracy of the school system is just driving them towards like anxiety and depression symptoms. Mm. It could be as straightforward as that. Uh, there are kids who are just way too fast for school and there are kids who just need a lot more time or they just need the freedom to dive into one thing really intensely uh, instead of being forced to do a traditional curriculum. So there's all these different reasons that a kid might not be a good fit for school. And you know, the, the number of ones who are genuinely good fit for school, I, I imagine they are out there, but I really don't think that they're in the majority. Awesome. So then what are the alternatives? And then I think my final follow-up question I'm going to tell you now, my final follow-up question is going to be, you've got a parent watching right now and they are just terrified. They're like, we could never do that, Blake, Seth. Like, that is too scary. Like, so I have parents that come from sort of a, a very flexible mindset. They've seen a lot of alternatives. They're used to that sort of thought. Then we have the whole other side of the spectrum where it's like, no, you follow this path. Our kid needs to go to college. They need to be able to do this. I want them to be successful. I'm terrified that if we don't go down this path, that's not going to work. So let's go into what are other paths. And then what do you tell parents who are like, no, this is too, too intense. Sure. So the other paths can include the more like traditional progressive schools like Montessori or Waldorf. Uh, but often as those schools uh, age up and we, when you get into the middle school and high school years, they start to look a lot like just any other private school. Uh, I can and, attest to that. And they're not that different. Yeah. Um, so I tend to focus more on the more radical alternative schools, the ones that really focus on self-directed learning. And so these might be Sudbury schools or agile learning centers or liberated learner centers. There's a bunch of terms that most people have not heard of, but these cool, innovative, very small learning communities are scattered all across North America and their numbers are growing. Um, I also talk about homeschooling and unschooling, which is the world that I've spent the most time in, which is just taking advantage of very lax homeschooling laws to focus exclusively on self-directed learning with your kid and nurturing their interests and passions and curiosities. Uh, so that, those are the, the main options that we talk about. Uh, there are you know, some cool charter school options or virtual school options, but by and large, those tend to end up looking pretty conventional in the end. Um, and for the parent who's super- Let's, let's break down self-directed learning in, yeah. in just a, a brief description of that. Self-directed learning means uh, you follow the child and that is a, it's a double-edged sword because a lot of parents are happy to do that when their kid is automatically interested in something that's like societally approved. So like right. the kid gets super into physics. You're like, yes, of course, be a self-directed learner. Uh, the kid is super into, I don't know, creating art, something that's very tangible. Um, it's easy to support a self-directed learner in that case. But when your kid's super into Minecraft, and that's what they want to do for eight hours a day, um, it gets more difficult. But the idea is that you are, you are actively nurturing their uh, intrinsic motivation drive. And by doing that, they are learning to overcome obstacles. It's, it's the reason that games are such powerful forces in so many kids' life. Games, very broadly speaking. Um, a game is something where a kid will voluntarily take on challenging tasks for the reward of just getting more challenging tasks after they win. And so that is really what you wanna be doing as a parent is encouraging a young person to take on more and more challenging tasks, especially as they get older and they move towards adulthood. And that's the point of being a self-directed learner. It's like, yeah, let your kid follow their passions, not because what they're you know, focusing on specifically in this moment is necessarily what they're gonna do as an adult, you know, the kid who goes through the Minecraft phase is most likely not going to become some professional gamer or programmer, but they are learning what it's like to be totally immersed in something, totally focused on it, which I believe is what most of us want in the end from the process of education, mm -hmm. being able to be an effective learner and to, to execute on things. So 
you go wherever that, that attention and that focus um, lies and, and you follow the kid. That's what being a self-directed learner is about to me. And you made a really quick comment that you kind of blew by really fast where you said something about um, if they were doing things that are valued by society. And <clears throat> so many things in that kid, so many of these strengths and interests and passions and curiosities that kids have are not measured by traditional schools. So oftentimes we measure math, science, social studies, language arts, et cetera. And, and we, have, we have constructed systems that where we are measuring things with certain metrics, usually tests and essays. There are others, but those are the most common. And we just have, we think that that's the way to do it, but there are so many other valuable things to learn and get interested in. Um, that are not measured. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think you did when you mentioned the Minecraft thing. I think that's one of the biggest objections that parents would have. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to reframe the conversation about learning uh, by changing the metrics. And I think the really important metrics to talk about are uh, engagement. And, and that is what I say all the time. Yeah, yeah. We're of like minds here. It's like, if the kid is totally engaged in something, that, that is when the magic is happening. That's when the growth is happening. But if it's something that's not societally approved, then it's very difficult to be supportive as a parent. And that's where the work is for the parent, um, is to be able to see through uh, you know, what seems to be maybe a mindless or a worthless activity and to see at, at root that there is a high level of engagement happening and that they, that kid is in that flow state, you know, as defined by the guy with the crazy last name, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And, uh, you know, this is when kids lose track of time. This is when they become uh, completely immersed in an activity so that uh, it seems like nothing else exists. And, and that, that can be kind of a scary thing to see as a parent because you, then you don't exist anymore. But uh, that state is worth nurturing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, if I had a magic wand and I had to pick one thing that we would change the way that we evaluate schools and teachers and teaching on, it would be that rather than looking at, um, at all the data that we typically look at, we would look at how is, so there's, there's a lot to be learned from gaming and stuff like that. But the question would be, how is engagement. So if you're going to look for your A plus schools online, they would be the ones where kids are most engaged. If we measured schools by how engaged the kids were, we would be doing things very differently. I, I agree. Yeah. So I think you were getting to, um, if, if this seems a bit random, I don't think this is a very I think it's fairly linear where we're going, but I think you were getting to, okay, so then what happens after high school? So we have sort of these alternatives at younger ages, unschooling, homeschooling, alternative schools, um, and we get past high school or into, I guess, if they were being unschooled, you wouldn't really call it high school, right? The high school years. But we get through the high school years and we're on to this next chapter. The traditional is go to college or go to voca vocational school or whatever. Oh, one thing I really like about Blake is the gap year stuff. We haven't, I don't even think we mentioned that yet, but I'm a huge fan of gap years. But so it's, it's uh, after high school years, what are the options? I mean, the options are pretty much the same as the options for a kid who goes to regular high school. And what I've seen is that by and large, uh, kids who are unschooled or they go to these radical alternative schools where nothing is really asked of them all day, um, they do end up going to college. The majority of them do. There have been some surveys that, that show this is true. Um, but they do it on their own schedules. And often they take advantage of the community college system, which is a really incredible and powerful and accessible system in North and America. And underrated. Yeah. and and kind of unfairly maligned also, kind of like the GED. It's a very useful tool, but it has a, a certain stigma around it, especially if your parents went to, you know, highly selective colleges. Um, but a lot of these kids end up taking part-time community college classes starting around age 16, 17, or 18. 
and they get these transferable credits that show that they can handle college level work. And then they either apply as a freshman using their, uh, their you know, transcript that maybe their mom made for them, in addition to some community college credits and maybe take the SAT or the ACT. Um, or a lot of them just build up enough transferable community college credits to then transfer in as like a junior transfer. And so a lot of them do go to four-year university and uh, essentially if they want to go, then they get in. And, and just like regular high schoolers, they're not all gonna necessarily get into their first choice uh, schools, but there's no great epidemic of unschooled or radically alternatively schooled kids, you know, wanting to go to college and not being able to go to college. And then some of them do move straight into career and some of them take their time and they take a gap year, then maybe they take a second gap year. And then they decide to go to college when they're age 19 or 20 and they're really ready for it instead of just following the herd. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So let's do a completely shameless plug for the book. And I just want you to really, I mean, you, you do an awesome job. So what, um, <laughs> Just seriously, like what's the benefit of the book for a parent? I think the benefit of the book is that uh, there's lots of books that talk about homeschooling specifically or talk about a certain kind of alternative school. And I just lay out all the options and talk about them on fairly equal footing. Um, also, I go into a few places that, that radical alternative education books often don't touch, like um, a lot of the research around parenting a lot of the, the discussion and the recent research around the value of higher education, because all these systems are interconnected to say like, yeah, you should stop sending your kid to regular school. Uh, that draws in a lot of other considerations about like, well, what does it mean to be a parent nowadays? What does it mean for my kid's economic future if I'm somehow jeopardizing their higher education prospects? And so I'm drawing in a lot of other um, topics a lot of other research. Uh, there's a lot of citations in the book and it, it just, it goes deep. And I think it's uh, a really great book. And a lot of my colleagues in the self-directed learning world have nice things to say about uh, the early version of the manuscript that they've read. And so I, I think it's gonna be good. I think it's gonna be the, the best book that I've ever written. And it's gonna inspire a lot of parents to worry less about taking an unconventional path when they see that that's clearly what is going to serve their kid who is suffering in school right now. I like the way you just worded that last sentence. What's going to serve them best? And um, so my last question, so we'll link to, I think it's, it's on a, it's a Kickstarter at the moment, right? The Kickstarter and the Kickstarter will run until noon on February 20th. Cool. So we'll link to the Kickstarter. If anybody's interested in that, check that link out. And then the last question I would have is for the parent that's watching, that really is that parent that year after year, they're like, my kid is not built for school or school is not built for my kid. And my kid feels bad year after year. We keep trying different things or different teachers or different schools or different approaches. We feel like we're failing our kid as parents, like we're doing something wrong. Our kid feels bad about themselves. Everybody something is seriously not working what is one action that they can take after this call uh today or the next couple of days um for that that parent that's like my kid is not just school is not seem to be working there's probably an alternative to conventional school in your area that you don't know about yet and so the action is to go find that i've got links up on my website blakebowls.com y the letter y uh, to help you find resources and groups or schools that are in your area and just set up a visiting day. Go and visit this group or this school or this center for one hour. Take your kid along, just see how it feels, kind of suss out the vibe. And that alone, even if you don't decide to do anything alternative, just knowing that there are options out there can really put your mind at ease. Dude, you're awesome. Thank you so much for doing the work that you do. I don't know if we've ever discussed how you got into this. That's not appropriate for right at this minute, but Blake, thank you so much for your time and your heart and your energy and, and helping kids. Yeah, thank you very much, Seth. All right, take care, everybody.